All right, if you take your Bible tonight, turn over to the book of 2 Corinthians, and we're going to find our text in chapter 12, and then we're going to go back a little bit there, so if you'll find your place there in chapter 12, we'll get started there. When you have a weather like we've had the last several days, it's enjoyable on the outside. It messes up our thermostats somewhat on the inside, changes our heating and cooling. Now, always, I've noticed, if I were to take a poll, how many people are cold? About half of you. How many people are hot? The other half. A handful of you are just right. Uh, but in the new building, every Sunday, the temperature is going to be perfect. Nobody's going to be hot. Nobody's going to be cold. Now, do you believe that? Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's just going to be a bigger place to be hot and cold, okay? So there's all, but it will be a little bit more sophisticated system, so at least we uh, can explain to you how we don't know why it's hot or cold. Uh, but there's always some uh, always challenges when it comes to the temperature. So some of you have sweaters on, some of you are fanning, but uh, we uh, certainly hope it will be at least a little bit improved. I would encourage you, if you have an opportunity, we try to keep, and yesterday may have been an exception, but uh, we try to keep it fairly a hazard free on the weekend if you want to walk in and take a look and see the progress and again you won't see um, a lot of difference for the next month or so more or less just uh, the subs coming in for electrical HVAC that type of thing the sheetrock won't go up until after that but they are beginning to form most of the walls and the stage and that type of thing to get a little bit of an idea um, it's amazing how it changes shape when you first walk in you see the slab and you kind of scratch your head and say that's all there is to it and then the more the walls they build, you think, man, that's pretty good size. And so uh, we trust the Lord to get that in our hands here if he tarries in the next several months. And trust we'll be moving in there. So we trust that will be the case. As you find your place in 2 Corinthians 12, I want to read the text there. That Hopefully it's a familiar text. And then go back and put it in some context. So let's begin after we have a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you tonight for the opportunity again to open up the word of God. Lord, we believe this book. Believe it to be your very word that can challenge us and help us tonight. We pray that the word of God would have free course. If there be even one tonight here in the service or perhaps even watching remotely that does not know the Lord Jesus Christ, that they would come to receive you even today. We pray for believers today to be strengthened, to be challenged to a new level of growth. Or there's nothing in me that certainly could accomplish that, but we know the spirit of God could take his word and accomplish eternal things. We trust that you would, in Jesus' name, amen. I noticed the Apostle Paul, as he's writing to these people, and we look as by way of text, in the verse 9, when he said, God said unto him. And you'll notice, if you have a red-letter Bible, this is one of the few places in the epistles where you find red letters. He said unto me, and he's quoting Jesus, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now, he deals with this theme of infirmities and how, obviously, as you put it in context, he has dealt with this infirmities in his own life to the point that the Lord had to remind him that not all infirmities were going to be taken away. But in the midst of the infirmities, God could give grace to overcome it. Now, the Apostle Paul uniquely had the ability by testimony to tell us how the grace of God was sufficient. Now, I have to remind you the last time we looked at this, which I think was a couple of weeks ago, and we looked at this early chapter. Look back to chapter 11 in verse 1, and notice how he begins this whole theme. He says, Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Now we went over the first part of this chapter in detail, but remember the theme, the Apostle Paul is concerned about their spiritual warfare, welfare rather. He is concerned that others have come in and have undermined him personally, and if it were not under inspiration of God, perhaps we would wonder about Paul's motives, though Maybe not because of his character, but clearly because God inspired him to write this. We know his motive is pure. He is not worried about the self-criticism. He's not worried about these people who have said, I don't like Paul. I don't think he's a legitimate apostle. He's a renegade. He's just kind of off on his own. He doesn't follow the other apostles. None of that bothered him personally. 
But he says, if you listen to these men, knowing well that I have laid the foundation for your spiritual warfare, welfare, that they could undermine what I'm trying to teach. And, of course, he talks about the false prophets. The devil has his false prophets, and the devil has his preachers, and he deals with that context. And then look down to verse 16. I say again. So now he's following up from that first verse. He says, I say again, let no man think me a fool. If otherwise, yet as a fool, receive me, that I may boast myself a little. He says, look, don't think that I'm foolish, but if you do, at least just bear with me a little bit in my folly. He's being a little bit sarcastic. Now, he's following the advice of Solomon in chapter 26 of the book of Proverbs when he says, answer not a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. And then he turns around to the very next verse and says, answer a fool according to his folly. Now, sometimes it's right to not answer a fool, not even give his uh, argument any credence. But then sometimes there's a point, lest he be wise in his own conceit, that we do answer a fool according to his folly. Paul says, let me just take these people in context that you've listened to, and let's just compare them with the Apostle Paul. Now, Paul is obvious as he writes this, comments that he makes, the, the parenthetical passages that he puts in, he reminds these people that he doesn't like to talk about himself. You'll see a couple of times, he says, I speak as a fool. I speak foolishly. Hey, I, remember, I'm just using an analogy here. Remember, I'm not trying to brag on myself, but it's, nece it's necessity that I might make this point. Now, Paul the Apostle had these men who came in. They were uh, supposedly converted Jews. They claimed to be uh, Christians, but they never left the Jewish background they still tried to keep that background and of course Paul said that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth and so they came in and said Paul doesn't follow what we're doing he's going off just traveling everywhere and he claims he's talked to God but we really don't know if he did when clearly the signs of an apostle he's going to mention were wrought among him but he gives here as a testimony he says I want you to see how God has used my ministry and the lesson that he has taught the Apostle Paul, and his lesson was, my grace is sufficient for thee. Now, that's a lesson that all of us need to learn. You see, it would be much easier if God would remove difficulties, but it's much better for us if he gives us grace to overcome them. Now, Paul uses this example. He starts off in this chapter and shows us, first of all, grace is sufficient for earthly trials. Have you ever been through a difficulty because you're a Christian? You ever had a relative that maybe uh, shunned you a little bit because they knew when you showed up at the family gatherings, you, you know, things wouldn't be the same because you're a Christian? You ever felt out of place because on the job, everybody gathered around, maybe they tell a dirty joke when you walk up, the atmosphere changes? Have you ever felt like you didn't fit in your neighborhood because uh, you knew if they had a, a block party and invited you, you weren't going to feel comfortable or be a part of it because what they were going to be? I mean, you can go through some trials like that. Maybe you've gone through more significant trials than that. Maybe because of your testimony for Christ, you've actually received verbal persecution or whatever it may be. Well, you know, Paul, it's an understatement to say he suffered for being an apostle. When he made that decision that day on the road to Damascus, and he said, Who art thou, Lord? And he took Jesus and he was instructed in the faith. He well knew that the path he was taking would ostracize every friend, so-called, that he had ever had. He knew that he could have been a well-respected Jew. He was sat at the feet of Gamaliel, highly educated, well thought of. Uh, Jewish historian Josephus tells us that he was uh, possibly going to be in the Sanhedrin as a young man. I mean, what a background he has. He said, those things that were gained to me, I counted loss for Christ. Then he comes into a place like Corinth, labors on no man's foundation, reaches people for the Lord Jesus Christ, prays for these folks, uh, has a tremendous ministry, gets a church established. It's recorded over in the book of Acts how he had began that thing. And then, of course, they had some difficulties, and uh, he wrote back, and they saw a little bit of victory. But here is a group of people who have come in to undermine the Apostle Paul. Now, did those people have the church's best interest? Well, look down in verse uh, 19. He says, you suffer fools gladly, seeing yourselves are wise. Again, he's being sarcastic. For you suffer if a man bring you into bondage, 
That is, he's trying to bring the law back and get you to live under the law, which you were never part of. If a man devour you, if a man take of you, if a man exalt himself, if a man smite you on the face, and perhaps Paul was even maybe exaggerating there, but it's hard to imagine, but he's basically saying if somebody came in and did all of these negative things, the tendency of your flesh would be to follow him. But if a man comes in and tells you the truth of God, the flesh somehow doesn't want to hear the truth. But Paul says, well, I've come in and I speak concerning reproach as though we had been weak. How be it whensoever any is bold, he says, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. The reason he said I speak foolishly is their boldness was not boldness from God. And Paul said, so let's just compare their life with mine. Hesitatingly, with a little apprehension, Paul says, I hate to talk about myself, but you know, just to vindicate my ministry, just to, because your growth is on the line, let me just stop for a moment and tell you what God has done through me. Now, you know what the other men probably did? They probably came in and they were probably like a bunch of preachers today. Let me tell you how big my church is. Let me tell you how many people I've won to Christ. Let me tell you how successful I am. You know, I've told you before, I love the statement by Bob Jones Sr. that success is finding the will of God and doing it. Now, no doubt these critics like they came in and they had their accolades and they wanted to be called, as Jesus reminded us, call them doctor, sit them in the highest seat, give them respect. Paul says, okay, you've seen their side. Now, let me show you my side. Now, look at some of the things he mentions. He says, are they ministers of Christ? <laughs> I speak as a fool. I am more. I preach for Jesus. He said, in labors more abundant in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. He says, of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Now that wasn't Romans, that was Jews. You know, Paul didn't have to be beaten by the Jews. Paul could have gone into a city, he was a, a Roman citizen, and th when he went in, they branded him a heretic. They said, if you claim to be a Jew, and you're going to preach in our synagogues, what you're preaching is heresy, and they brought out Roman ju or uh, uh, Jewish justice on him, which, of course, according to the law, you couldn't beat a man over 40 times. So they would back off one just to make sure they weren't going too far. He could have said, I appeal to Rome. I'm not going to do this. You're not going to beat me. I'm a Roman citizen. But no, he yielded to it because he was burdened for his people to Jews. He said, I'll go ahead and let them beat me. I'll let them beat me because it might give them the opportunity for me to still have an ear with them. And, of course, he did continue to have an ear with them. Not only had been beaten, he said thrice I was beaten with rods. You remember a fellow who, I don't know, vandalized a car or something back in the 90s, I believe it was. Some of you will remember. It was on the news. It was a big story. This guy was an American citizen, went over to Thailand or something, and he vandalized a car, and they were going to cane him. And they kind of showed the technique of how this took place. It's unique. Not too many people vandalize cars over in that area, understand? And he was an American citizen, but he had been caught, and they were going to carry out this punishment and so forth, and it was a big deal. They took a big old, you know, a cane, and the guy knew what he was doing, and he just whacked the guy's back with it, and it was quite the punishment. That was a Roman punishment, and basically that's what happened to Paul. Not once, not twice, three different times, he was beaten with rods. Now, we didn't see that in the book of Acts, but Paul says, let me just share that with you. I have never have mentioned it to the people at Galatia. I didn't bring it up to the churches at Ephesus. I didn't bother telling those churches at Thessalonica, but since I've got these folks and since you want to bear with me a little in my folly, for your spiritual warfare or welfare state, uh, sake, I want to share it with you. Now, we know at one time he was shipwrecked. We saw that in the book of Acts. Do you know we find out here it happened more often? Uh, we know that he uh, was in prison. At least we saw him in the, you know, at Philippi in prison, but he was often in prison. We know he went through near-death experiences on multiple occasions. Now we find out that it happened quite a bit. He says in uh, 26, verse 26, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Now here's the big old highbrow uh, PhD preachers who've come in, uh, 
you know, showing you how great they are, telling you all of their accolades. Paul says, let me tell you what my accolades are. I've suffered for Jesus. He said, when I decided to follow him, I decided to follow him. Now, none of this was a lie. It was all true. He said, this is what I went through. Beside those things in a... Uh, in verse 28, beside those things which without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. He goes on in verse 30 and says, if I must needs glory, and that's kind of like bragging. He said, if I'm going to brag, he said, I will brag or glory of the things which concern my infirmities. You know, God's ways are not our ways, are they? Man doesn't brag about his infirmities unless he wanted to impress you with them. Look what I can take. Look what I can do. Paul wasn't doing that. He was basically saying it's worth it to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. How did I get through it? That's Paul's message. How did I make it through this? Because God's grace was sufficient. Now, as he gives that account and he's telling it for the first time, and we know this because we're familiar with the life of the Apostle Paul, but imagine as these Corinthians are reading through this letter from the Apostle Paul. Most people loved Paul. He had a few enemies that had been influenced by these false teachers, but most people were for him. And Paul's letter comes, and they're assembled there, and they're reading this letter to the assembly, and they're hearing this story. Paul, how did you do it? How did you take it? How did you go through all that? You know, I never thought about it. I knew Paul had some trouble over at Lystra when he got stoned. And I knew there were some times that he had been in jail, but boy, I just never realized he went through all of that. It's amazing to think that Paul, the apostle, the great preacher, he never told us that when he came. How in the world could he do it? How would he make it? Only by the grace of God. So Paul goes on to explain it in chapter 12. He says, it is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. That's not expedient for me to glory. That's not the best thing. He's saying it's not best that I would just simply brag about myself. That's not my intention but he said, let me go a little bit further into this. Because the grace of God is, first of all, sufficient for earthly trials. He's established that. But then he t reminds us something else about the grace of God. This is somewhat incidental, but look if you would. He says, I will come to the visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Whether in the body I cannot tell or what out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such a one called up to the third heaven. Now, it's pretty obvious, as Paul tells this account, that he is the person that he's referring to. It's quite evident that Paul is speaking of himself, but it's such a holy occasion. It's such an unusual thing. He is so hesitant to put himself in this position that he literally says, I knew a man. Well, he, that's true. He did. He knew, he knew himself. And it's clearly who he's talking about because he goes on to, make, to tie it together. But he said, I knew this man in verse 3. He said, I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth. How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Now, I want to stop for a moment and think about this because, yes, Paul is in the process of making a point to these people. He's, he's talking about the infirmities that he went through, and, he's, and the grace of God is sufficient to help him in that. But I'm reminded as I read this about the Apostle Paul that the grace of God has a, and this is near and dear to us when it comes to grace, but it's certainly not something I want to overlook. The grace of God is sufficient for eternal salvation. You know why I'm going to go to heaven one day? The grace of God. Not because I deserve it or I've earned it or somehow I've acquired it. It is God's grace to me that has caused my sin to be dealt with through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I have nothing to offer. Nothing I can impress him with, but by God's grace. And Paul says, look, I, I'm not going to brag, but I'll tell you this. When it comes to visions and revelations, hey, God revealed some things to Paul that he didn't reveal to anybody else. He gave Paul the opportunity, literally, to go see paradise. Now, he says, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. You know what that ought to tell us? It's certainly a, a, another uh, instance where we find that this body is not us we just live in it it's a dwelling place it's a tabernacle you know if we were to have a funeral today and we've got a, a funeral uh, you know a person up here in a casket in the front of the church and we're that's all we knew that was our connection with that person and we often will talk about that person's not here you know like the uh, the one preacher who just you know said stuff off the cuff and he was just preaching along 
in the funeral, and he said, look, this fella, you know, I, want, I don't want you to mourn over him too much. I mean, this is not really Bob. This is just his shell. The nut is gone. Now, you know, you have to be careful how you put that, you know, but uh, it really, in a sense, it is the shell, right? I mean, the body is part of us. It's one-third. I mean, that is what I meet people. That's what I see. But literally, Paul says, I couldn't really tell the difference. My consciousness was in heaven. Now, a lot of folks think, and it's, it's pure speculation, that when he was stoned at Lystra, it appeared that he was dead. Everybody thought he was. That maybe at that point, if we could tie it to any instance in his life, uh, perhaps we could say when he was stoned at Lystra, he laid there. Nobody could get him to, if they thought he was dead, maybe that's when he went. And God said, Paul, it isn't all that bad. Let me show you what you got ahead of you. Let me show you what's ahead. And he called it paradise. My understanding is the word paradise means a royal garden. We know that uh, the Garden of Eden was like a paradise. We think about uh, Lazarus as he was in Abraham's bosom. We think of that as paradise. We get a little glimpse here where Paul said, I went to paradise, which is the third heaven. The first, of course, being the atmosphere. The second being the stars. Beyond the stars where God lives, the third heaven unattainable except through knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know I'm reminded today that because of the grace of God, there is a real place called heaven. It's where God lives. You know, the only way I'm going to be able to live with him for all eternity is the grace of God. Aren't you glad today that heaven is not just theoretical? It's not just something to kind of encourage us along the way, like a fable or a, uh, just some of the little antidote that we give to encourage people. Heaven is is a place. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. It is a prepared place for a prepared people. You know, I think about, uh, you know, somebody here who lives um, a good uh, long life, uh, Brother Norton. He was 90-some years old, lived here on this earth, and every once in a while you'll see uh, somebody in the news who maybe made it to 110, 120 years old, we might even could go back and, and think, well, you know, I've heard my grandpa talk about his grandpa, and he lived several hundred years ago. You know, in a matter of, who knows, maybe it'll be uh, seven years, maybe it'll be a thousand in seven years, we don't know, but pretty soon, all this is going to be over. And we're either going to be with God in heaven or separated from him in hell. The grace of God is sufficient to get me to heaven through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now Paul speaks of this, not off the cuff, not like an illustration, he saw paradise. Now why didn't he tell us? He says it's unlawful for him to utter it. I don't know the idea here is so much that it broke some kind of a legal problem. It was impossible to utter. In other words, unlawful in the sense that a mortal tongue couldn't express it. Who knows what Paul saw that day? Could he have heard the angels sing? What if he was up there, and in the book of Acts, this wouldn't have been unusual. We know that when a sinner is converted, there's, present, there's joy in the presence of the angels, which is not the angels, but the saints. Could it be as Paul got up there, and maybe he talked to Jesus himself, and he's looking around, and he heard a big old roar, sound like a football stadium. What was that? Oh, a couple of folks just got saved down on earth. I mean, who knows what Paul saw while he was up there? And he had to come back. Now, that'd be an awful thing, wouldn't it? He had to come back. But when he got back, can you imagine Paul as a human being? He's just like you and me in that he's in flesh. He looked around at some of these critics, looked around at some of these people that didn't like him, looked around at some of these folks that claimed that they were preachers, and he thinks, oh, I've been up to heaven and seen Jesus. I've been to paradise. I mean, God, let me see the angels and Notice as he goes on here, and he says uh, in verse 7, Lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Do you think there wouldn't have been temptation for Paul to think that he was a little bit maybe higher than anybody else because he could think to himself, Look what I've suffered. He could think to himself, God, let me go up and see the third heaven. 
he could actually later in his life look back and say, God revealed to me the mystery of the church. How important must I be as an apostle? I mean, Peter, he's got a couple of little epistles over here, but he didn't know much about the church like I did. Look how smart I am and how God used my intellect. You say, not Paul. Hey, if any man think he stand, let him take heed lest he fall. Paul said, I didn't see it to begin with, but he said, now I see it. God sent a messenger of Satan to buffet me, a thorn in the flesh, so I wouldn't get exalted above measure. Evidently, every time Paul maybe had that little tendency to think, oh, look how important I am. Look how smart I am. Look how successful I am. Whatever this infirmity was brought him back down to earth. Now, who knows what that was? You can speculate. We know some things from history. We know some little comments that he makes. For instance, in the book of Galatians, we get the idea that he had eye problems. Um, we get the impression from the Corinthians they evidently had heard him preach, and evidently he wasn't a smooth talker. I don't know that he was exaggerating. It wasn't false humility. He said, I came not to you with excellency of speech. And even his critics said, look, in the, in the previous chapter, his, his letters are weighty and powerful, but his presence is weak and his speech is contemptible. Well, many times I, I just plug those little things in and I see Paul trying to, trying to read and study and, and get prepared to, to preach. And he, and he says, oh God, I, my eyesight's bothering me. Couldn't you, couldn't you give me a little bit better eyesight? I'd be so much better at studying and reading and writing these letters. And he prayed about it. Then he got up, he got up to preach, and people got saved. But he said, God, if I didn't stutter so much, how much better could I preach? See, unless he get exalted above measure... I don't know what God gave him now. Maybe it was his speech, his eyesight. Maybe it was a little bit of all of it. Or maybe he'd just get up in the morning and he was just so tired. Man, his bodily presence was weak and he had an aching back. And, oh, God, if you just give me a little more. And he prayed. Notice it says now, I besought the Lord in verse 8 thrice that it might depart from me. Now, why did he have this infirmity? Two reasons. God allowed it and the devil sent it. You know, what happened to Job, isn't it? The, the Lord tested Job, but the devil actually did the testing. You know, the devil, probably when he heard from God that he could go test Job, he said, oh boy, I couldn't do it until God told me I could do it. Because God didn't let me get at Job. There was an invisible force field around him. I can't touch him. He, I just can't get there. God said, all right, I'll remove it. But you can't take his life. The devil said, oh man, boy, am I going to show Job something. Let me ask you, when it was all said and done, and for how many years now, some, oh, 3,000, 3,500 years, people have been going to the book of Job, and they've read that and said, you know what, if Job could make it by the grace of God, maybe I can make it. Don't you think the devil perhaps has scratched his head a number of times and said, that sure backfired on me. Well, you notice what he said about Paul. Oh, boy. God has given the apostle Paul. He's been leading people to Jesus left and right, starting churches. And I don't know why, but God has given me an open door, and boy, am I going to send, hey, you, uh, Charlie, you go get Paul, and you stay on him. And you give him these three problems right here, and you stick with him. I bet after a while, he scratched his head and said, hmm, that didn't turn out too well for me. Because you know what it caused Paul to do? To depend on God. Now, just how much power is going to be, if I can say it in human terms, how much power is going to be unleashed from God to man when man fully depends on him. You know, I'd like to be able to just turn on a light switch and say, I'm going to depend on God. Because if I do, I'm going to have God's power on me. I'm going to be highly effective. My testimony is going to be vibrant. My witness is going to be effective. I'm going to have the joy of the Lord as my strength. So I'm going to get up tomorrow morning, and I am just going to utterly, completely, without reservation, depend on God for everything. It'd be good if I could do that. But evidently, I can't just turn on a switch and do that. God has to bring things in my life to cause me to do that. Now, when he does, the Apostle Paul had the messenger, and he prayed thrice. You know, there's a lot of prayers, actually, in the Bible that God didn't see fit to answer, at least not the way they were prayed. You know what Abraham prayed? He said, God, oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. I wonder if Abraham's 
glad he didn't answer that prayer. You know, Elijah prayed, Lord, I'm no better than my fathers. I'm requesting that you would take my life. I think going up in a chariot of fire was probably a little bit better than God killing him on the side of that mountain. You know, sometimes it's a good thing when God says, no, I'm not going to answer your prayer. Paul the apostle prayed it three times. It certainly implied when it says a thorn in the flesh that it was a painful thorn because that's what a thorn analogy would be. It certainly had to do with a physical infirmity because it was a thorn in his flesh. Whatever it was, it caused him some kind of problem physically. He prayed for it and God did not heal him. You know, it isn't always God's will to heal. Now, many times it is. James 5 makes it clear. Sometimes we can pray for the sick, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and God will raise him up. Uh, the context of that seems to be when it's brought about especially as a chastisement, and there's some sin involved. God's willing to do that, restore the person. We pray for folks. There's people in this congregation. We've prayed for them to get well, and they've got well. Are we going to give God the glory for that? Most certainly. God answered prayer, and he often does. He does say we have not because we ask not. Paul wasn't wrong to pray for it. But when God said, don't ask me anymore, let me give you my answer. The answer is, my grace is sufficient for thee. I'm able to provide the need. And the grace of God is sufficient for external infirmities. You know, I don't know why God allows all trials. I can't give you the exact explanation, but I know it's to, to make his grace known. I don't know why God allows physical infirmities, but with part of being living in this world, we're a fallen race, we have physical problems, but I know that God uses it to demonstrate his grace in our life. So he says in verse uh, 9 again, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You know, we may have to struggle. We may go through some difficulties. But if we're believers and we know Christ, if there's one thing that there ought to be a thirst for in our heart is the power of Christ, to have his hand on our life. I don't even hold a candle, nor do you, to some of the things the Apostle Paul had to go through to see that happen. But in whatever way that might be, we thank God today that his grace is sufficient. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer tonight. Lord, how we thank you tonight for reminding us of your word and the truth of your word, that you're able to provide grace for every need. Whatever it is we struggle with, whatever difficulty, you make yourself known. You empower, you give us direction. How we thank you for your direction, your power today. And Lord, remind us when we go through those difficulties, when the devil fights and there's hindrances, that Lord, it would cause us to look to you for your strength and help. Lead us tonight. Encourage us. Be with the rest of this service. May you get glory through it. Lead in the invitation in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand tonight, sing an invitation song, 496, a familiar song, I Surrender All. If you're here tonight without Christ, I invite you to meet me here at the front. I'll have someone take a Bible and show you how to be saved. As a Christian, if you need to find a place of prayer, I'd invite you to come as we sing, 496, I Surrender All. Would you be seated just for a moment? We're going to prepare for a baptism. It's his son, so he's going to go back there. We're going to page 517 in our hymn books. Page 517. I'm resolved. Page 517. I am resolved. Oh. 
This is John Joe Salazar, and he is bigger than he used to be. <laughs> but I wanted to hold him up because I know you can't see him, and so we certainly appreciate him and his family. I talked with him last week, and I asked him about his testimony. And, of course, many young people would have a similar testimony. I said, well, John Joe, when did you get saved? And he looked at me, and he said, well, I don't remember exactly when, but I know I'm saved. And, of course, I asked him how he knew that, and he gave me a good testimony you understand today that we baptize John Joe not to wash away his sins. There's no power in this water to take away sins. The moment he trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, his sins were taken away. But we put him in this baptism today to be a testimony to those in the world, to you today, that he has trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. As he goes down into the water, a picture of the burial of Christ. He comes out and reminds us of Christ's resurrection and that we're to walk with him in newness of life. So, John Joe, upon your profession in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, and in obedience to his command, I baptize thee, my brother, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death, and raised again to walk in newness of life. Amen. Amen. Well, all God's people said, Amen. What a blessing. Let's go ahead and stand. We're going to be dismissed in prayer. And uh, Virgil Zipper, would you pray for us, please? It's just going to, nobody's going to be every Sunday by half of you. But on the inside side, it messes up our, we're going to go back a little bit there. So.